Well, hello, I'm Bill Simpson. I'm at my cabin in scenic and picaresque Russell Gulch, Colorado. It's April 3rd, 2020. This is the first in a series of lectures on Hume's inquiry concerning human understanding for my philosophy students at Metropolitan State University of Denver. Now, in the inquiry concerning human understanding, Hume makes, generally speaking, three bold moves. First, he undertakes an analysis of what the Cartesian self experiences. Secondly, he gives us an analysis of how propositions are known. And then third, he traces out the ramifications for what we can know, given the results of these two analyses. Now, my project for today is to look at Hume's analysis of the experience of the Cartesian self against the background of preceding modern philosophy, and then apply those results to our idea of causation, or at least give David Hume's account of what happens to our ideas of causation, uh, given the results of his analysis of the inner mental states of the Cartesian, I think. To review, the failure of the ontological argument knocked Descartes back into the solipsism that he was trying to escape at the end of Meditation too. And the only certainty that can be garnered by a Cartesian self is that it is on hand only in the moment that it's having a cognitive episode. The eye of the cogito may or may not be present over time, cannot be certain that there are other beings, and it doesn't know whether or not it inhabits a physical world. Now, given that the whole point of the meditations was to set human knowledge on certain foundations, in Descartes' words, to establish something firm and lasting in the sciences, this is a revolting development. Now, from the death of Descartes in 1650 until Hume published the Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding in 1748, there were various attempts to resolve the difficulties that we encounter in the meditations, particularly those difficulties with mind-body interaction. But we also find philosophers attempting alternative proofs for the external world. Now let's take a look at one of those alternative proofs for the external world. In a 1675 letter to Simon Fauché, and Fauché was a Parisian critic of uh, Descartes, uh, Gottfried Wilhelm Friedrich Leibniz attempted to use logical entailment as the basis for a proof for the external world. And his proof looks very much like Descartes' proof for the external world. Now let's look at Descartes' proof for the external world one last time. Premise one, if I can identify some mental content that I could not have generated for myself, then there's an external world. Premise one. Premise two. I couldn't have identified, I couldn't have generated the idea of God for myself. Hence, there is an external world. Now, since the ontological argument is invalid because Descartes wanted to make existence a predicate, premise two has to be excluded. So what does Leibniz do? He has an alternative premise too. So logical entailment, what do we mean by that? Uh, logical entailment is a formal requirement of reasoning that makes some statements or inferences necessarily true. For example, if there was no property, then there could be no theft. That can't be otherwise. If you understand what the words mean, you understand that that statement is necessarily true. Now here's Leibniz's argument. Premise one. If I can identify some mental content that I could not have generated for myself, then there is an external world. Premise two. Logical necessity does not depend on us. 
we do nothing more than recognize it. Hence, the very nature of deductive argument points to something beyond one's own mind. So let's leave it at that. Keep that in your memory banks for when we talk about Saul Kripke and Thomas Nagel later on in the course. Now, let's go back to the problem of non-material causation uh, in the venue of mind-body causation. So, at the end of Meditation 6, we saw that uh, Descartes um, thought that mind and body were interrelated, interpenetrated, because we perceive them that way, and God underwrites the verticality of our perceptions, and God is not a deceiver. Now, once the ontological argument fails, all that goes out of the window, what do we do next? Well, one philosopher by the name of Nicholas Malbranche introduced a theory called occasionalism. And here's what it says. God intervenes directly to facilitate mind-body interactions. So, for example, when I thumb my nose at you, that's God's work. Now, you'll also notice that this is just a psychologized version of Plato's Demiurge. Let's try another philosopher, George Barclay. Well, he solves the problem by denying bodies altogether. Now, there's an apocryphal story about how Malbranche and Barclay met up. Uh, Malbranche delivered his theory of occasionalism. Barclay said, but, but Father, why can't we just dispense with bodies altogether? And then Malbranche immediately has a stroke and dies. Okay. First recorded instance of murder by philosophy. Now, what happens when I thumb my nose at you and I'm George Barclay? Well, in that instance we have a perceptual event, but not a physical event. Now back to our friend Leibniz. Leibniz says that yes there are minds and yes there are bodies but we don't have to assume that they interact at all. Rather, from the dawn of creation, God synchronized minds and bodies like watches. And so, if I thumb my nose at you, that's God's foreseen activity, even if in God's supreme goodness she didn't intend me to do that to you. So it's foreseen but not intended, and it's just minds and bodies taking out concurrently over time. And so you'll, you'll see philosophy by the time uh, Hume comes on the scene in the middle of the 18th century, uh, philosophy is in a, a desperate state. And desperate measures need to be done. Or, you know, as that great Colorado philosopher Hunter S. Thompson says, uh, when the going gets weird, the weird turn pro. And, well, Hume wasn't an oddball. Apparently people really liked hanging out with him. He's ready to make some really extreme moves. And Hume's first bold step is to undertake an analysis of the experience of being a Cartesian ego, and of forthrightly drawing conclusions about the limits of knowledge on the basis of that analysis. So, Hume's school of philosophy is called empiricism. It comes from the Greek verb empirein, to experience. Uh, sidebar. Um, Descartes and Leibniz are usually classified as continental rationalists. Uh, and this is an alternative experiment that begins with the requirement that logical certainty um, should be the starting point for inspecting our mental contents rather than uh, just inspecting those mental contents and sussing out whatever in, in the implications we can find. 
So, what mental contents does Hume discover when he looks inward? Well, he discovers what he calls perceptions, and perceptions come in two flavors, and, and you really need to think of them as flavors. They're mental contents, and some are of one sort, some are another, and that's that. So, perceptions can either be impressions or ideas. Uh, what's the difference? Well, impressions are more forceful and vivacious. Uh, this is what Hume says on page 10 of our text. By impression, I mean all our more lively perceptions when we hear, see, feel, love, hate, desire, or will. And what are ideas? Ideas are merely copies of impressions. As Hume says, the most lively idea is inferior to the dullest perception. Furthermore, all mental content traces back to impressions. The idea of blue stems from various versions of blue experiences. My idea of Golden Mountain is compounded from experiences of gold and mountain. And what does Hume say about our complex idea of God? Well, this. The idea of God, as meaning an infinitely intelligent, wise, and good being, arises from reflecting on the operations of our own mind and augmenting without limit those qualities of goodness and wisdom. And that's the analysis. Full stop. What are the implications? Number one, you can't get the idea of something without an experience of it. And so in the 19th, or pardon me, in the 18th century, they used to throw pineapple parties. Somebody would grow a pineapple in his hothouse, invite his friends over for dinner, and send them home with a new experience and a new idea of what a pineapple is. That's one implication. Another implication is that animals may have experiences that aren't available to us. And so on page 12, Hume says, it is readily allowed that other beings may possess many senses of which we can have no conception because the ideas of them have never been introduced to us in the manner by which an idea can have access to the mind, to wit, by the actual feeling and sensation. And so, for example, bats have a sense of echolocation that is inaccessible to us. And a third implication is that Hume has developed a bullshit test. Again on page 13. When we entertain, therefore, any suspicion that a philosophical term is employed without any meaning, or idea, as is but too frequent, we need but to inquire from what impression is that supposed idea derived? And if it be impossible to assign anyway, this will serve to confirm our suspicion.